Today we are here to celebrate 90 years in the life of John Harvey Burroughs. My father was born in New York in 1924 during the Great Depression. His mother Rose immigrated from Italy as a child, but his father's family can date itself all the way back to the Revolution. His father George was raised a poor kid by a single mother who took in sewing work to support the family. George got his first job sweeping the sidewalk in front of a bank called the Guarantee Trust Company, and over time and lots of hard work, he was promoted to working as a bank clerk. While my father was busy working his way up the bank ladder, my father was a happy kid running around the streets of Brooklyn. His life revolved around hanging out with the neighborhood kids, playing stickball in the streets, and getting into mischief. The 1920s was a time when people still had ice boxes, not refrigerators, and when cars were vying with horse-drawn carriages on the streets. In the summertime, my dad told me one of their favorite treats was to follow the ice man driving his horse-drawn wagon, laden with blocks of ice cut from frozen lakes. As it was making deliveries in the neighborhood, my dad and his friends would wait to snag an ice chip to suck on. Ice was a rare commodity back in those days. When the winter came, the boys would sometimes build a fire in an empty lot to cook potatoes they had pilfered from their parents' kitchens. When the skin was black from the fire, they knew the potato was cooked inside. I can't imagine kids having that kind of freedom today. My grandfather George worked his way up to treasurer of the bank and eventually was promoted to the youngest vice president of the bank and he began working with production companies, loaning money to make movies. This is where the family became part of the movie industry. While George's job took him away from the family and into a more glamorous life, his marriage with my grandmother Rose was on the rocks, and my father was often sent away to live with different parts of the family. One summer, he remembers being sent to live with the Italian side of the family, with an auntie and her two beautiful daughters. The auntie didn't speak a lick of English, but could cook up a storm in the kitchen. Dad quickly learned all the Italian words having to do with eating and food. Growing up with him, I remember him saying, Mange, mange, the Italian phrase for eat, eat. It was a common phrase in our house. This is a picture of him many years later with the D'Ambrosio side of the family. Dad is in the middle top row, and Auntie is in the chair on the bottom row holding a baby. In this picture, you can see the two sisters who helped translate that summer for my dad. They were certainly both ex exotic Italian beauties. When my father was 13 years old and his sister Rosemary was born, he was sent off to boarding school at Andover Phillips Academy. My dad resented being sent to a prep school, as he loved his independent life running the streets of Brooklyn all over the neighborhood with his friends. When he arrived at Andover, he was assigned an older student as a sort of big brother to help him settle into prep school life. He was called Poppy by his friends, but you may know him as George H. W. Bush, the 41st President of the United States. Even George was not equipped to deal with the anomaly that was my father. My father was a fish out of water, being a street urchin from Brooklyn thrust into the wealthy prep school life. When the kids found out he came from Brooklyn, combined with his darker Italian complexion, the other students assumed he was Jewish and called him Ike. And in a very un-PC way, they chanted, Izzy, Ikey, Aby, Sam. We are the boys who eat no ham. My father obstinately chose never to correct them, maintaining his own solidarity with the Jewish kids he was friends with back home. So the nickname stuck with him, and he was called Ike the entire time he attended Andover. His stubborn streak also showed up when he was told all freshmen had to wear a beanie hat called a prep hat their entire freshman year. If an upperclassman caught you without it, you would suffer the consequences, 
which was being tossed into the freezing cold pond, clothes and all. Well, my father obstinately refused to wear the prep hat. He was thrown in the pond on about four different occasions. After the second or third time, Poppy told him to stop being an idiot and just wear the damned hat, or something to that effect. But it wasn't until the water in the pond got too icy that he finally gave in and consistently wore the darned hat. My father also likes to say that at Andover, trouble always found him. He was one of the few boys that had a single room in the house he was assigned to live, and all the boys in the house liked to hang out in his room. Apparently, there was a pillow fight one night, and the feathers exploded out of the pillows. To get rid of the evidence, my father dumped the feathers out his window. Not thinking things through as kids are wont to do, he didn't realize the wind would take them all over the lawn, leaving a snowy carpet of feathers that blanketed the campus. It didn't take much to discover the mess originated from underneath his window. He was called into the headmaster's office, and not for the first time. His crowning achievement, which finally got him kicked out of Andover after his second year, was when he was riding his bike on campus and rounded a corner too fast and ran straight into the headmaster in full cap and gown. Needless to say, as his cap and gown went flying, so did my father, straight out of Andover. At the end of that year, the headmaster suggested firmly to his parents that they move him to a school with greater supervision. My father left his mark on Andover, however. I hear bike riding is no longer allowed on the Andover campus. The summer after leaving Andover, my grandfather sent Dad to live with his sister Vera and her husband Harvey Cook in Westbury, New York. Living with the Cooks was his first experience of what a healthy family life could be. Harvey and Vera took my dad under their wing, and with a little tough love, got the mischief maker on the right track at home and at school. The Cooks had two sons, Harvey Jr. and John Cook, who were younger than my father, but they were all raised like brothers. Harvey Sr. is famous for holding my father out the second-story window by his heels when he wouldn't take a bath. And Gladys enforced a strict study schedule from 7.30 to 9.30 every night. Then, at 9.30, he was allowed to listen to his radio shows. He listened mostly to big band music and his favorite radio show of all time, The Shadow, with Orson Welles. At this point, my father discovered that radio was a passion of his. He met a boy who had a receiver, then met an older man who taught them Morse code and how to build a radio from scratch. The man told him and his friends they could come over any night and listen in whenever they wanted. My dad loved listening to people from other countries communicating to one another, and he listened for hours. He finally begged his parents to buy him a $26 receiver so he could transmit from home on his own. He got a radio license right away and started his own communication with people all over the world. This talent would become very important later in his life. My dad finally finished out high school at the local public school in Westbury, New York, and with the loving guidance of Harvey and Vera, he ended up graduating with honors and being accepted to Yale. They gave him a big send-off. Dad began his college career at Yale in 1941 and quickly joined the swim team. He lucked out and was given a big double room in the graduate law student's house instead of being in the crowded dormitories where all the other freshmen were stuck. But his roommate never showed up, so Dad was on his own again, and a little lonely this time. However, on the train up to Yale, Dad met a fellow named Bert Brody, and when Bert saw the dormitory he was assigned to, and then saw the huge graduate student room Dad had, he quickly asked if he could switch bunks with the missing roommate, and he moved in with Dad. 
Their room overlooked the local high school, and they enjoyed watching the girls, who were just a year or two younger than them, in the schoolyard. If they saw some cute ones, they would hold up a sign in their window, giving the girls their room number, and ask them to come up for a visit. Sometimes they actually did. Dad's peaceful beginnings at Yale were soon over, however, when the attack on Pearl Harbor occurred that December. Soon after, the entire Yale swim team joined the Navy, including my father, and he was sent to officer's school at Harvard. With his background understanding Morse code and the radio, they trained him to be a signal officer. When he finished officer's school and was supposed to catch the train to take the soldiers to California, he was given a proper send-off by a lovely actress named Mary Ann, who later married into the Reynolds Rapp family. You can see her on the left of the photo next to my father. To the right of my father is Gladys, my grandfather's second wife. She loved drama and glamour, and she really did love my grandfather. She and Marianne concocted a love scene for my dad and Marianne to deliver on the train platform as his big send-off to war. As all the Navy boys were on the platform getting ready to ship off, this beautiful redhead kissed my father passionately, cried loudly for his safe return, and promised her everlasting love at the top of her voice. The sailors shipping out that day were an unknown audience of my father's first love scene. He was infamous on board that train. After finishing in San Diego, my dad was shipped off to Honolulu to await his deployment to the USS Longa Point. While waiting in Hawaii, he was promoted to captain of a submarine a Japanese submarine, to be exact, one that the U.S. had captured. His sole job was to take dignitaries and their families on tour of the submarine. Helping ladies down the ladder was a real hardship, I'm sure. <laughs> when he finally arrived aboard the Lunga Point, he was their signal officer and worked in the radio department. In this picture, you can see him in the crow's nest where he loved to be. Even when he was off-duty, he enjoyed being up in the radio department, looking out to sea. As the signal officer, my father was responsible for decoding messages and giving them directly to the captain. He was the first one on board to find out they were going to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Then, when the bombs had been dropped and Japan had surrendered, they found out from the airmen that the Japanese were summarily executing prisoners of war. The captain told the radio operator to send a message directly to the President of the United States to inform him what was going on. However, the radio man didn't know how to send a message across the horizon to the other side of the world without going through the Navy, which would take a long time. Since my dad had been studying radio for years, he knew everything about calling on the radio and ended up teaching the radio operator what radio frequencies were able to get beyond the horizon to send a message to the other side of the planet. So it ended up being my father who was responsible for transmitting the message directly to the president regarding the fate of the POWs. Since the Lunga Point was the closest ship to Nagasaki, the president requested the crew go in to save them. This was not something the Navy boys were trained to do, and he said they were not required to do this. Well, the captain called the entire crew on deck. He told them what was happening to the POWs and said that no man on board would be required to assist in saving them, but that any who wished to assist should take a step forward. Every man on deck took that step forward in unison. The entire ship unanimously decided to make their way to land to save the POWs. So the captain asked for his own motorboat to be readied, and he took six gun toters to protect him. They captured a small Japanese fishing boat and brought the fishermen aboard ship by gunpoint. They knew that he would be able to help them navigate the minefields off the coast of Nagasaki and bring them safely to shore. My dad was looking over the crow's nest, watching the entire exchange. Once they arrived on shore, 
my father was one of the officers, armed only with a pistol, that went out in search of the POWs. When they saw how emaciated and sick the captured soldiers were, the captain sent my father back to ship with the men who could still walk, and had my father organize transport for the disabled soldiers. The captain and the other officers stood by on land to protect them until their transportation arrived. Seven hundred and sixty prisoners of war were saved at Nagasaki that day. The Lunga Point cleared their decks and created makeshift beds for the men as they were transported to the safety of Okinawa, where they received medical attention. My father is one of the only men from the Lunga Point alive today who went on land just days after they dropped the atomic bomb. These next few fuzzy pictures are all we have showing my father out on shore leave during the war. When the war was over, my father was recognized for his service in sending the message to the president, and he was asked to stay on as head of the radio department. After my father finished his term of service in the Navy, he returned to Yale. This time he went to Davenport College, and he finished out his Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering. While doing so, he helped create the first Yale radio station. He was mostly in charge of setting up the different shows on sports or politics, social stuff, and he even did an expose on the girls' colleges in the area. Watch out for Vassar. Any student on campus who knew how to clip their radio wires onto the radiators could hear the news and sports just like on a regular radio station. Occasionally, someone would miss their airtime, and Dad would have to fill in on air. Sometimes he'd talk about life in Brooklyn, since nobody at Yale knew anything about Brooklyn life, and they were interested. The school eventually shut it down, because the freedom of speech on the air was maybe a little too free for their liking. <laughs> Yale has since reopened and permitted the radio station, and it's still on the air today. Here is a picture of the ham radio my father put together after the war. My brother and I have vivid memories of him using it on weekends in the garage when we were children. He used that radio until he could no longer get the glass vacuum tubes replaced, and the last tube broke. So he went out and bought a real radio station in Fresno with his friend, John Hooker. K-E-A-P. <laughs> it played mostly country and western music. My brother was so inspired by all the radio activity that he created his own pirate radio station in Olympia for many years, until it too was shut down recently by the FCC. My dad graduated Yale in 1948 and was offered a job in his field of electrical engineering all the way south in Peru at a copper mine. But my grandfather, who had made the jump from vice president of the bank to vice president of Allied Artists, was living in Hollywood making movies now and asked my dad to come out for a year to be with him so they could have some time together again. True to his word, my grandfather gave my father a job at Allied Artists where he was asked to count inventory of the entire studio. Work your way up was his motto. Counting the studio inventory, my dad ended up meeting everybody in the company, all the producers, directors, etc. And since he was so likable, Walter Mirisch brought my dad on board as an assistant while he was making Bomba the Jungle Boy. That was my dad's first movie in 1949. It was all shot in Thousand Oaks where there was a ranch of safari animals nearby that they were able to use in the picture. They used a lot of elephants in this movie, and my dad found out that elephants did not like cars, and whenever possible they would get a trunk full of water and shoot it out at the cars. The crew learned quickly to park a good distance away from these elephants. My father became close with a producer named Lindsley Parsons. You can see him in this picture on the top row in the middle. This is the man who mentored my father and taught him everything he knew about making movies. They became close friends, and Lindsley often had him out on his sailboat. 
In this picture, you can see the sailing crew ready for a race down to Ensenada. Unfortunately, the crew drank so much alcohol the night before that they came in last. My father didn't care. He just liked being out on the water. Lindsley and my dad started shooting small serial westerns, one after the other, over a period of about a year and a half. They were shot in ten days. But my father saved them a lot of time and money by introducing multiple cameras instead of using just one camera at a time. Their shooting schedule reduced from ten days to seven thanks to him. My father has always looked at safe ways of reducing a budget, and that is what he has been known for his entire career. By 1950, my father decided to stay in California permanently, so he returned to New York to bring back his things and bought his first car, a used Chevy. He brought his mother and sister with him for the drive to California. They drove all of Route 66 from New York to L.A., and they stopped at every tourist stop they could. They took a two-car barge over the Mississippi River, visited the Grand Canyon, stayed at the famous Wigwam Hotel in Arizona with all the Indian teepees. They went to Yosemite and ate picnic style the whole way. If you know my father, you know he isn't happy unless he's had a salad at least once in the day. So when you travel with him, you bring all the fixings for a good salad and a Tupperware to eat it with. While his mother and sister enjoyed the rest of their summer in Hollywood, my father went to work on Torpedo Alley, the first big-budget movie he received a screen credit on as associate producer. Allied artists asked him to take their newest starlet out to buy a new wardrobe. So my father spent an afternoon with the beautiful Dorothy Malone, and they became fast friends, staying in touch for many years until she was married. That was her first picture in a starring role. I love how she's looking at my father in this picture. And his sister Rosemary was enamored with the star on the right, Mr. Mark Stevens. The following summer, my father's cousin John Cook came out to spend a summer with him and see how movies were made. My father put John in the movie Oregon Passage as an Indian in one scene riding bareback on a horse and in another scene as a soldier fighting off the Indians. John took his scenes and milked them for all they were worth. But the movie that won all the acclaim for my father was Al Capone. My father and his friend Leonard Ackerman partnered up to produce this picture, but they had a little trouble along the way. The Mafia figured they owned the story and didn't want the picture to be made. My grandfather ended up having some questionable connections with the mob and was able to smooth everything out with a nice little payoff. The movie ended up being released with much acclaim, and the picture was even shown at the Cannes Film Festival. My father started spreading his wings and enjoying the life of being a producer. He had a friend who raced cars for a living and was given two cars every year to race, which he could dispose of as he wished. So in 1957, my dad bought this little red 190 SL Mercedes convertible for $6,500. When his longtime friend Miko celebrated Christmas with her preschool kids, Dad would dress up in a Santa suit like you see here and drive up in the Mercedes to deliver gifts to all the kids. So sweet. My grandfather George and his wife Gladys were quite the glamorous couple in Hollywood, and Rosemary enjoyed being a part of the glitz as well. George and Gladys decided to invest in racehorses, since they loved going to the Del Mar racetrack for many years. They started their own stable with some friends called Gladflow Stables and enjoyed the notoriety of occasionally being in the winner's circle. This is a photo of the famous jockey Willie Shoemaker winning the Labor Day purse at the Del Mar racetrack on the horse the Duke of Mala. You can see my father in the winner's circle below with yet another beautiful lady on his arm. In this picture, he's posing with his sister Rosemary around the jockey statue that was a gift for my grandparents. 
It remained in front of their apartment until it was stolen about 20 years ago. My father decided to start investing his money, and for a time owned some oil wells in Texas and California. This is his oil baron picture that I call. They never made any real money, and my dad sold the oil wells off after a while. But he was very smart at investing and saving his money, and to this day still takes care of my stock portfolio. I joke around that he may never remember where his keys are, but you can always ask him what Bank of America is selling at, and he will be accurate within a point. And at least he can say he was an oil baron for a little while. The best investment my father ever made was marrying my mother the movie producer, and the preacher's daughter. Some thought it was an unusual relationship, but it has been a 48-year-long love story that continues on today, thank goodness. My father married my mother in 1967. He was 43 years old, and she was, well, let's just say, a lot younger than him. My brother and I were born soon after, and we were truly lucky kids. Dad was still working on everything from feature films to movies of the week, TV series, pretty much anything he could to support the family. Family has always been my father's main priority. We spent all of his time off with him on the water. John and I could both practically swim before we could walk. My dad shared his love of music and radio with my brother and his love of sailing with me. We all loved to be by the water, and Dad gave us all a love of kayaking. As kids, most of our family time was spent on the water in Newport Beach, and you can see us with my grandmother Rose in front of our little summer place, just steps from the beach in Newport. When we had to move from Newport, we started going to Morro Bay. That tradition continues today with our families and all the grandchildren as well. We just spent another week at Morro Bay all together, and we hope we have many more years to come. My brother and I just want to say how honored we are to have such a loving and gentle father. He taught us to treat all people the same and never to judge. We both ended up bleeding heart liberals because of him, and he used to joke that he had a son who majored in college to be an Indian chief, and a daughter who majored in recycling. But really, it all comes from the ideals we learned from him. Be good to one another and take care of the world around us. We learned it all from you, Dad. The whole family and all our friends love and honor you today on your 90th birthday. We love you, Dad. Thank you.